you take your Bibles and open to the book of 2 Corinthians. For those Bible scholars out there who happen to forget where that's located, it's right after 1 Corinthians. So as a reminder, uh, last couple months we've been looking at Christ sending out the 12 and the message that he gave them to say the kingdom of heaven has come near. He gave them lots of expectations for going out and sharing that message and some instructions along with those expectations. And the reality was it was not all positive. There was some positive, but there was also some negative because the message was going to be rejected. And so after looking at Christ sending out the 12 and the difficulty that he told them to prepare for, I want, to take, I want us to look in 2 Corinthians for the next month or so um, at the incredible message of the gospel. And so last week we started in the second half of chapter 3 looking at the, uh, this ministry of glory, this ministry of, of grace and glory that comes because of the message of Christ, where it says in verse 9 of chapter 3, the scripture says, For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness overflows with even more glory. In verse 12, Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness, Verse 17 says, now, now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so this message is one of freedom. It's one of hope. It's one of glory. And then he goes on in chapter 4, where we're going to be today, and he says in verse 1, Therefore, since we have this ministry, because we were shown mercy, we do not give up. Instead, we have renounced shameful secret things, not walking in deceit or distorting God's message, but commending ourselves to every person's conscience in God's sight by an open display of the truth. But if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so they, so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we are not proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves because of Jesus. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. This message of hope is hopeful because of Christ, but we have to remember, and what God reminds us of here, that we have this ministry. Why? Because we have been shown mercy. You know, the easiest thing for you and I to forget is how much mercy we have been shown. Because the, uh, within a split second, after you have been shown mercy, the mercy doesn't matter as much. Before you were shown mercy, that's all you cared about. But the moment that you have it, you're ready to move on. And so remembering what we were shown mercy or why we were shown mercy is such a significant part of the importance of this message and how we're supposed to share it. Let's look at the definition of, of mercy. So the, the mercy is the emotion aroused by contact with an affliction which comes undeserved on someone else. So I can feel mercy for someone else, or it's to show kindness or concern for someone in serious need. So did... Here's, here's the obvious one. Who has shown you kindness or concern in your serious need? Now, we're all in church. We just read the scriptures. We just looked at Jesus Christ. And, of course, you're going to say, the Messiah did. And you'd be right. You would be right that he showed you mercy in your serious need. And so because we have shown mercy, we do not give up. 
Give up on what? Give up on the people around us who don't deserve to be shown mercy. That's who we want to give up on. I don't want to give up on me. I mean, sometimes I feel that way, but in reality, I, I keep working for me. But the, what, what I really want to give up on is the idiots around me. <laughs> it's okay if you agree. We're, we're all in agreement here, okay? All right? I don't mean the people sitting around you. I don't mean to be offensive, okay? But the people in life around you, the idiots around you in life that you have to put up with, you're like, do I really have to keep, I mean, come on. And you know what I'm talking about. You're related to some of them. <laughs> not, once again, not the people sitting next to you. I mean, everybody else, obviously. But, we're re but we want to give up. And you know what? Part of the reason that, we're, that we think we can give up is because we forget how much mercy that we were shown, how much mercy God gave to me. You see, this mercy... Um, before I received the mercy, I had no hope. Before I received the mercy, I was a slave to the lies of sin that had bound me in misery. Thank you for that. But so before I received mercy, I had no hope of a future with God. The hope was based solely on me, and frankly, that wasn't very hopeful. But after I received mercy, th the doors of heaven were flung wide open for me. After I receive mercy, the Messiah welcomes me as his own. After I receive mercy, God said he's placed my sins as far from me as the east is from the west. By the way, interesting fun fact, the scripture never says that God forgets sin. Forgive and forget is not a Bible concept. God says he chooses not to remember it anymore. If you want to act like God towards those who have hurt you, you cannot forget the sin, but you can choose not to think about it. That's what God says he does for you. Why? Because you have been shown mercy. And so because we've been shown mercy, let's look at the mercy in Scripture here. In 1 Peter 1, verse 3, it says, The praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, uncorrupted, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Romans 9.15 says, for he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. What mercy were you shown? In Matthew 27, we see a picture of those who needed mercy. And frankly, you and I fit this picture so well, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. In Matthew 27, verse 39, the scripture says, Those who passed by were yelling insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, The one who would demolish the sanctuary and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders mocked him and said, He saved others, but cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. He has put his trust in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, even the criminals who were crucified with him kept taunting him. Did you know the simple fact that you are a sinner places you in the exact same place as those who were mocking him at the foot of the cross? Because that's what sin demanded. If you were there, you would not have tried to take him down. If there, you were there, you would not have intervened, no matter what you think, because the simple fact that he lived righteously and condemned sin would have made you feel uncomfortable and made you his enemy because you could not keep up with him. You could not attain. You could not understand. You could not be part of what he was doing because you weren't good enough. 
And the only solution was to remove the one that caused you such embarrassment, shame, and discomfort. But it was that very removal that brought you the mercy that you so desperately needed. Then Jesus said in Luke 23, 34, he said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. Because we have received this mercy and we continue to share mercy towards others, by the way, it's because they don't deserve it. That's why it's mercy. Showing kindness when they don't deserve it. He says, because of this, we have renounced the shameful secret things, not walking in deceit or distorting God's message. Here's the incredible part of, 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 of God's understanding of our nature, okay? Christ died for our sins because I had a problem that I could not overcome. So I accept his offer of forgiveness. Why? Because it is good for me to do so. It is. It really is. And that's okay. God knows it's good for you. He said it. He said so. So it's okay to accept it as good for you. But you know what? That does not eliminate my selfish, sinful human nature. As a matter of fact, some, for some people, it only emboldens their selfish human nature because they want to use that information for their benefit. They don't want to use it to benefit others. They want to use it to benefit themselves. And he says we renounce, we're not distorting God's message. We're not walking in deceit. We're not looking for my benefit simply because I have this incredible message of hope. Yes, it was for my benefit, but I'm not out there promoting my benefit with it. I'm promoting your benefit with it, which means I'm, pro I'm pointing you to Christ and I'm getting myself out of the way. I'm not special for carrying the message. But the message is special. See, that's, not dis that's, that's, that's focusing on the message. That's not, when you walk in deceit and you distort the message, you have to become a really important part of that message. People have to respect you. They have to honor you. They have to look up to you. They have to, they have to be thankful for you. And if you don't get that, you leave them because they're not good enough. <laughs> but if it's his message and I get out of the way, I'm not distorting the message. I'm not walking in deceit. I'm putting the emphasis where it needs to go. But he also says, I've renounced the shameful secret things. Ephesians 4 addresses these shameful secret things. In verse 17, it says, Therefore I testify, I say this in testifying the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their thoughts, they are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. They became callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity for a desire with more and more. You know what the next verse says? But that is not how you learned about the Messiah. I assume that you heard about him and were taught in him because the truth is in Jesus. You took off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires. You are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. You put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. Maybe you're sitting there and saying, yes, you have heard that before. That sounds great. I just can't seem to get a handle on it. Well, you know, last week when we finished up looking at the end of chapter 3, the Lord says here, he says in verse 18, we all with unveiled faces. Why unveiled? Because we can look at God's glory because we're in Christ. We can look at it without shame. With all unveiled faces are looking in a mirror, at, as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. Did you know how to become more like the Messiah is you stop looking at yourself and you start looking at him. You look at yourself and you're only going to become a worse version of what you are today because you have no power to make yourself better. You had no power to come to God. You had no power for forgiveness. You had no power for redemption. 
But somehow we have this distorted human way of thinking that now that I'm where I'm at, I can do this. And that's not what God says. He says we look at the glory of the Lord. We look at the Messiah. How do we want to be changed? We want to be changed by looking at his glory. What is his glory? His glory is that on the cross, he looked at those around him and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Why is that glorious? Because that was me. That's why it's glorious, because that was me. That was his glory looking to forgive me, to show me mercy. What is his glory? His glory is that he rose from the dead. And he's promised to raise me from the dead. That's his glory. You say, how does that help me with my current sin problems? Well, it's really simple. You see, it's an issue of focus. It's an issue of focus. All right? Any motivational speaker can tell you you're not going to get over the problem by focusing on it. Pretty common self-help thinking. Don't focus on the problem. Why? Because you're only ever going to be stuck at the problem. You have, to look, you have to look past it. The point is you have to look somewhere else. And what the Bible's saying is if you want to be transformed from glory to glory, look at Jesus, not yourself. So because we're looking at him, because we're being transformed from glory to glory, because we've been shown mercy, we are able to renounce the shameful, secret things. We're able to renounce them. Why? Because he took my shame and embarrassment when I'm focused on him and what he did for me. Guess what I no longer have? I no longer have shame over the sin that I've committed. That doesn't mean that I'm proud of it. it doesn't mean that I'm thankful for it. But you know what? If I look at him and the amount of shame that I put him through, to admit that I've committed these sins, that's not a big deal anymore. Now, if I look at me and how I feel and I look at how embarrassed, oh, my goodness, uh, if my focus is on me, I'll never be able to renounce my secret things, my secret sins. Why? Because I'm too ashamed by that. But if I focus on him and what he's done and the shame that he bore for me, guess what I can talk about without feeling too much shame? Those shameful secret things. Why? Because I'm looking at him. My focus is on him and not on me. Then he says, if the gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In other words, if you don't understand this, if it's not clear, if you don't have a way to grasp it, it's because you're perishing. It's veiled to those who are perishing. It's alive and visible to those who are in Christ. If this doesn't make sense, then it's because you're perishing. Because in their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. See, this veiled gospel, John, uh, Christ speaks of it in John 3.16. He says, For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. You said, where is the veil? Here it comes. For God did not send his son into the world that he might condemn the world, but that, that, but that the world through him might be saved. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned. But anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed on the name of the one and only Son of God. And here's where the problem comes for you. It says, this then is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who practices wicked things hates the light and, and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. Do you know why people don't want to accept Christ's forgiveness? Because by accepting his forgiveness, they have to acknowledge the misery that they created in their own sin. That is an uncomfortable place to put yourself. To acknowledge that, yes, I was responsible for that. That was me. I did it, and I was wrong. People don't want to admit that. So their mind, the gospel is veiled. The God of this age has blinded their minds. How has Satan blinded their minds? In Isaiah 14, we have this. In verse 12, it says, Shining morning star, how have you fallen from the heavens? You destroyer of nations, you have 
You have been cut down to the ground. You said to yourself, I will ascend to heavens. I, I will ascend to the heavens. I will set up my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of God's assembly in the, nor in the remotest parts of the north. I will ascend above the highest clouds. I will make myself like the most high. You know what Satan's lie has always been and will always be? It's the lie that he believed himself and the same lie that he's selling to you is that you are capable of being like God. You say, oh no, I don't think I'm really like God. Then why do you can try to control things so that they go the way that you think they should go? Why do you try to manage everything so that it happens the way you think it should happen? Is that because you say, well, I I'm just doing the best I can. Of course you are. Look at what Satan's been doing for the best that he can in trying to believe that he could be like God and the misery that that's created. And say, well, I'm, I'm not trying to be like God. How dependent are you on God to accomplish what he wants to do? How dependent are you on God to accomplish what he wants to do? Does it even cross your mind to find out what he wants to do? Or are you just focused on what you think should happen? You see, the lie of Satan is so deceptive and so, um, I can't think of another word, deceptive is the right word. It's just, it's so easy to fall to that we don't even realize that we're trying to take back some of the godness in us and, and exercise that control and authority. I mean, how, how many of us, by the way, it's all of us, how many of you have thought that if you were in charge of this country for just a day, you could fix so many of the problems that were there. But here's the simple reality. All of your solutions would fail epically because you're only human. How many of you have thought don't raise your hands. How many of you have thought, if I was in charge, first thing I would do would be ask God, what, God, what do you think should be done? If I was in charge and I had a plan, the first thing that I would do is say, God, what do you think of my plan? Should I even can try and go forward with this plan? God, do you want to change my plan? Is there any part of my plan that would be better if you t touched it and, and, and corrected it? If you're like me, those thoughts don't cross your mind very often. You see, we need to have mercy on those to whom, whose minds have been blinded Because we still struggle, even though we receive mercy, we still struggle with the same lies that they are bound by. The only difference is we're, we are walking in the light. We have the light of the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we're clinging to, and that gives us a, a, just a, a little bit of ability to see the lies for what they are, but we still struggle with them. How about the people who don't have that light and don't have the ability to see the lies for what they are, and the lies are the only truth that they know, and their minds are blinded because they can't even process that there's something out there that's a different truth. What God is saying is they need to be shown mercy just like you and I were shown mercy. Right, it says, for we are not proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. See, this glorious gospel of Christ and him is Lord. Jesus actually addressed this problem with the Pharisees in John chapter 8. 
I want you to hear yourself in the Pharisee's response. Not after you've received mercy, but before you receive mercy when your mind was blinded because you thought that you had all the, all the answers needed for your life to go in the right direction. Right? Here's, what these, here's how Christ interacted with these men. In verse 42, it said, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, because I came from God and I am here. For I did not come on my own, but he sent me. Why don't you understand what I say? Because you cannot listen to my word. You are of your father the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has not stood in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Who among you can convict me of sin? If I tell the truth, why don't you believe me? The one who is from God listens to God's words. This is why you don't listen because you're not from God. Here's their response. Aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? Now, by the way, this doesn't mean much to the modern English reader. But let me quickly highlight for you a simple fact. His mother was not a Samaritan. Joseph was not a Samaritan. Both were full-blooded Jews. So what were they actually accusing him of? They were accusing him of being a bastard child. That's the right, way, right use of the term, by the way. And not even worthy to be in the temple worshiping God. Now, they had no evidence of that, or they would have physically thrown him out of the temple. But they were making the accusation because they were saying, we don't even know who your father is. For all we know, you shouldn't even be here. So you're a Samaritan and have a demon. Jesus said, I do not have a demon. On the contrary, I honor my father and you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. The one who seeks it also judges. I assure you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death ever. Then the Jews responded. They said, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death ever. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? Even the prophets died? Who do you pretend to be? Now they believed that God had given his word through Abraham. They believed that God had given his word through the prophets. Now they didn't follow it all. But they believe that it had come from God through these men. And so they're saying, we know who these men are. We know that God used them. Said, who do you pretend to be? Jesus responded. He said, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. My father, you say about him, he is our God. He is the one who glorifies me. You've never known him, but I know him. If I were to say I don't know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham was overjoyed that he would see my day. He saw it and rejoiced. The Jews replied, you aren't 50 years old. And you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, I assure you, before Abraham was, I am. And then the Jews picked up stones to try and kill him. Why? They picked up stones because Jesus used the phrase with which God gave Abraham his name. When Moses, when, well, I'm sorry, gave Moses. God gave Moses his name. When Moses was at the burning bush and God instructed him to go and deliver the people of Israel, he, Moses said, who will I say sent me? And God said, say I am that I am has sent you. And in here, in, um, in, Math, in John 8, when Jesus said, I assure you before Abraham was, I am, he actually uses two Greek words that mean independently of each other, I am. So it is properly translated, I am, 
But it could also be properly translated, I am, I am. And they knew that he was making a direct comparison to the God that they thought they were worshiping. You see, the glory of this gospel of Christ is truly amazing. People's minds are blinded to it because of the lie, but it doesn't change the glory. And he says, for we are not proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. And, and, and as slaves, and ourselves as slaves because of Jesus. In Matthew 20, Jesus called over his disciples and he said, you know, the, in verse 25, he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles dominate them and the men of high position exercise power over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great, you, great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, if your life is really about the gospel, then it's okay for other people to tell you what they think is most important. If your life is really about the gospel of Jesus Christ and that's what matters most, then it's okay for you to be wrong about your ideas and your plans. If your life is really about the gospel of Jesus Christ, then it's okay for somebody else's opinion to be more important than yours. By the way, I'm simply describing the role of a slave, in case you haven't caught on yet. By the way, in our culture, we don't have slaves. But a boss at your company is not radically different from a slave master. After all, isn't the boss's favorite mug the one that says the boss is always right? Right? You ever seen the, the boss, the, 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 the two rules for the boss? The first rule is the boss is always right. And the second rule is in the case that the boss might be wrong, refer to rule number one. And, and the Lord is, so, so we're used to this concept in the world, but for some reason we put up with it. Why? Because we expect to get benefit by that submission. Benefit for me, personal gratification that I want, that I choose to say, okay, I'll submit to that idiot for a time being. Why? Because I want something in return. Usually it's money, but, you know. But he's saying because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have made ourselves as your slaves because of Jesus As for God, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts the, to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Here's where this wraps up today, which, which is such an encouraging point for us. You see, when he says God who said, let light shine out of darkness, he's simply quoting from Genesis 1-3, when God said, let there be light, why there was no light, it was darkness. So let light shine out of darkness. God who created what he's saying, the God who created light has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus. You know, the, the glory of God did exist in the face of Jesus in Matthew 17, right? When uh, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up onto the mountain and suddenly Moses and Elijah appear with him and then his whole body shone bright and his whole countenance changed. But did you know that you have the opportunity to see the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ? If you look at 2 Peter 1.16, the scripture says, For we do not follow cleverly contrived myths when we, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now remember, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, Right? So in Peter, 2 Peter, Peter's saying, I saw his majesty. My eyes saw him in his majestic glory. So we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Verse 17, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, a voice came to him from the majestic glory. This is my beloved son 
I take delight in him. And we heard this voice when it came down from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. Why was it a holy mountain? Because God's glory came down on, down on it. So obviously it was set apart. So we have the prophetic word strongly confirmed. You will do well to pay attention to it. To what? To the prophetic word. What's the prophetic word? It's right here. This is the prophetic word. Prophetic word simply means it came from God, by the way. Prophecy is not about the future. Prophecy is the word of God. Of course the word of God does involve the future because God knows the future, but the word of God is his prophecy. It's for yesterday. It's for today. It's for tomorrow. So the prophetic word was strongly confirmed, and you will do well to pay attention to it. Here's how you pay attention to it. He describes it for you. He continues in verse 19. As to a lamp shining in a dismal place. Now, if you've ever, if you've ever been camping, and you've been out in the middle of nowhere, and there's no moon, and it's a cloudy night, it's a dismal place. You, you get nervous even trying to walk in the woods because you can't see the ground well enough to know what you're stepping on. And if you've ever been out there, the only time you go into the woods when you have to go to the bathroom and you kind of walk like this because you're, you're like, okay, I got it. Okay, okay. All right, there's one step. And, you, you know, you kind of take these very careful feeling steps. Why? Because you can't see anything. It's dismal. And if you have a light, what is your, what is the... The most important thing is you pay attention to that light. Why? Because it allows you to see. Without the light, you can't see. It's dismal. It's dark. You don't have a way of knowing where you're going and what you're looking at. And so he says you pay, a, you pay attention to the prophetic word the same way you would as a lamp in a dismal place. And you pay attention until this. You ready? You pay attention until the day dawns. And the morning star rises in your hearts. Do you get the picture that God creates here? Your life is a dismal place. You can't see and you don't have clarity. You don't know what to do next. You don't know where you should go. You don't know what the future holds. It, it, it all seems scary and overwhelming. And so God says, pay attention to my word. This prophetic word that I give you, pay attention to it. Meditate on it, study it, learn it. When you do, you do this until what? Until this allows life to make sense. That's the day dawning. The day dawns, you don't need the light because everything makes sense. The little light doesn't illuminate. And if you've come to Christ as Lord and Savior, you have the small first grasp of life making sense. But you need more. Right? And when he says here in, in verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 4, he says, this, this God has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. If you're missing that glory, God gives you the answer. He says, study my word and pay attention to it. And my word will allow things to make sense. As a matter of fact, you pay attention to it until the, days, the day dawns and everything becomes clear. And how do you know the days dawn and everything's come clear? Because you can see it all. And it's not confusing anymore. And then the morning star, obviously, is Jesus Christ. And when the scripture makes sense and when the scripture illuminates things, Jesus Christ rises in your heart because you start to realize your hope has nothing to do with your plans. Your hope has nothing to do with your ideal future. Your hope has nothing to do with Th people just getting out of your way so you could get stuff done the way it should be done. That's not hope. 
Jesus Christ is the hope. When he's my hope, guess what? It's not a big deal to become your slave to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. By the way, I'm not saying I do a good job at that. I'm just saying when that's my focus, it's not that difficult. <laughs> so maybe you're here this morning and you say, Steve, this all sounds great, but I'm, I'm, I'm not doing a good job at it. Well, welcome to the club. Join the party. All right? None of us are doing a good job at that, myself included. But you have to start somewhere. You have to start somewhere and say, okay, God, am I going to start now? Am I going to start now focusing on this as, it, as if it is the only light to provide hope and light in the darkness of this miserable world that I can't seem to find a way out of, that I can't seem to find hope in? Or am I going to keep groping in the darkness, carefully checking my steps, that, hoping that I finally find that pot of gold that's going to give me everything that I finally wanted? And then maybe you're here and you say, not much of this makes sense. I think I might be part of that, that group that's blinded by the lie. Well, that's really quite simple. If you're willing to say, Jesus, you died for my sins because I was the one that put you on that cross. You suffered shame because my sin is shameful. If you're willing to say that, acknowledge that, and not hide it, guess what? You now understand a little bit of light. And God will shine his light into your heart and give you that hope. You say, this, this all sounds great, but it's not, not easy. You're right, it's not. Next week, by God's grace, we're going to look at how the Scripture says that God gives us this treasure in clay jars. Why use clay jars? We'll, we'll talk more about that last, next week, but the simple fact is they're fragile <laughs> and breakable and repairable sometimes, but... Um, God knows our weakness, and he's going he's gonna to walk with us through, even with our weaknesses. Well, let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power of your truth. Lord, teach us to focus on your word, that we might know the light of the glory of the gospel in your face. Lord, anyone here who needs to repent today, Lord, may you give them the, the, the faith that they need to repent and turn back to you. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.